Hello, I'm Sofia, and welcome to What We Need to Know About Ukraine. Here, I learn about Ukrainian history, literature, and culture, and share my findings with you. Today's episode is about New Year's Eve and New Year's Day traditions and history in Ukraine. New Year's Eve in Ukraine is called Shchedry Vecher, or the Eve of Generosity in English, or perhaps the Generous Evening. The tradition of the Generous Evening dates back to pre-Christian times. According to pagan customs, on the first day of the new year, Ukrainians honored the gods Vasil and Malanka. According to the legend, the goddess Lada had a daughter, Malanka, who was kidnapped by a snake and imprisoned in a dungeon. Malanka's fiancé, the god of the moon, was out hunting, so the hero Vasil, or Basil in English, saved the girl. With the advent of Christianity, the interpretation of the holiday changed. The Orthodox Church associated this day with the memory of two saints, Basil the Great of Caesarea and Melania of Rome. Basil the Great, and Basil the name is Vasil in Ukrainian, was a prominent church figure and one of the fathers of the church, as well as the Archbishop of Caesarea Cappadocia in Asia Minor. He is credited with the invention of the iconostatus and composition of the liturgy of Basil the Great. Malanka, or sometimes known as Malanka the Younger, was a nun and philanthropist. She is known for building churches, helping the needy, and caring for the sick during the decline of the Roman Empire. Therefore, New Year's Eve is also known as Malanka and New Year's Day as Basil's Day. Now. On New Year's Eve, services are held in Ukrainian churches where people thank God for the past year and ask for blessings for the next. According to the weather on Malanka, it was predicted whether the next year would be fruitful. In particular, frost on the trees would mean a bountiful year. Snow falling would mean a good harvest of vegetables and grains. Warm weather meant that the summer will be rainy. And if the sun rose high and the last day of the year was clear, then the whole next year will be happy. The Eve of Generosity can also be called a bountiful feast, because the feast on this day has a special meaning. Ukrainians believed the more generous the celebration in Kutya, if you don't know what Kutya is, listen to my episode called Christmas in Ukraine, Traditions and History, the better the family will live in the new year. In contrast to Christmas, dishes use meat and other products of animal origin because the fast is now over. The main ritual dish of this evening is kutya, and this one can be made with lard or cream. That is why it is rich or generous. In addition to kutya, roast beef, homemade sausages, pies and vareniki with cottage cheese, as well as pancakes are prepared on the eve of generosity. The pancakes, I mean crepes, or as Ukrainians call them, mlinsi. Birds and fish are not served so that happiness does not fly away or swim away. The whole family sits down at the New Year's table. Everyone should be neatly and festively dressed, because dirty or untidy clothes are considered a bad sign. Before starting dinner, the family prays and thanks God for health and well-being. Then everyone tastes the kutya and starts dinner. There is a legend that even the animals talk on New Year's Eve, but you cannot eavesdrop on them, so the owner has to treat them to some food from the table. Ukrainians also baked special ceremonial bread. When the woman began to knead the bread for baking, she went without washing her hands with her husband to, quote, frighten the trees that did not bear many fruit in the past year. At the same time, her husband took a stick or an axe, approached the tree, knocked three times on the bark and said, if you don't give fruit, I will chop you down. But if you grow lots, I will respect you. The wife had to answer for the tree. Don't cut me down, I'll still be useful to you. And after that, she wiped her hands on the tree bark. After the feast, it is customary to ask each other's forgiveness in order to live peacefully and in harmony in the next year. And young people traditionally get dressed and sing shadrivki. What those are, you'll find out shortly. People would also drive away all evil spirits and congratulate everyone on the new year. In the old days, on the night of Malanka and Vasil, old clothes were burned and new ones were put on, and this symbolized the beginning of a new life and, of course, a new year. At that time, unmarried girls traditionally did fortune-telling. Moreover, on the 31st of December and the 1st of January, 
men traditionally go to propose, so at this time, unmarried girls can expect suitors. This is also a time when they can propose again, and maybe get a second chance if they were previously rejected. The rites of the generous evening end with the burning of the diduch, a decoration made of wheat, which is placed in the corner of the house on Christmas Eve. In some regions, there is a tradition of jumping over bonfires. In pagan times, this rite was considered a purification from evil spirits. And now let's talk about Shedrivki and Shedrovanya. Shedrovanya, or New Year's Eve caroling, is one of the most interesting New Year's traditions of the Ukrainian people. Women and girls gather, dress up, and go around their neighbors, singing Shedrivki and complimenting as well as wishing well to the people whose houses they go to. They begin this after sunset when, according to beliefs, various evil forces emerge, and they keep singing and walking around houses until midnight. The purpose of Shedrivki, like in Christmas carols, Kolatki, about which you can listen in my episode Christmas in Ukraine Traditions and History, is to glorify the owners of the house that they sing at and their family. For example, quote, Generous evening, good evening, good health to good people. It was believed that the singers and their ritual songs could help grow a better harvest, bring happiness and wealth to the household. That is why people would treat the carolers and give them money or sweets. Now, only women would be allowed to go shedrovate, or carol on New Year's Eve, but men had an important role the next day. But what is the difference between Christmas and New Year's Eve carols, you may ask? Shedrivki is a type of Ukrainian ritual song that was sung since ancient times, and only in March, when the swallows returned home. Ukraine used to celebrate New Year's in the spring a long time ago, because it would seem like the spring, nature, and animals are coming back, one can plant crops again, and therefore there is a new year. To differentiate between the Christmas Kolatki and the New Year's Shedrivki, we can see that Kolatki talk about Jesus and his birth, meanwhile Shedrivki talk about birds, nature, and generosity, etc. Both Kolatki and Shedrivki belong to the genre of songs that were performed in Ukraine even before the advent of Christianity. Carol of the Bells is a translation of a Ukrainian Shedrivka that was written by a Ukrainian composer Mykola Leontovich in approximately 1917. Early in the morning of January 23, 1921, Leontovich was murdered by a Soviet state security agent while Mykola was staying at his parents' home. The Soviet agent was undercover and had asked to stay the night at the house. He even shared a room with Leontovich. At 7.30 in the morning, he murdered the composer and robbed the family. By the time a doctor arrived, Leontovich died of blood loss. And now back to Mikola Leontovich's Shedrik. Me saying that it is a translation is not accurate at all, since the lyrics in the English version are about Christmas and in Ukrainian are about a swallow. Shedrik in Ukrainian means both a type of bird and, of course, stems from the word generous. It is most likely the most well-known Shedrivka in the world. Another example of Shedrivkas is this one that I have translated. Shedrik, Shedrik, Shedrivochka, a star shone in the sky. So we came to your house, we wish everyone health, may your year be wonderful, only joy come to your porch, may your family be happy, and so may all of our Ukraine. The music playing in the background throughout this episode, as well as the few songs at the end of the episode with lyrics, are all Shedrivkas sung during Ukrainian New Year's Eve. Everything that the beautiful maiden dreams of on the night of the new year will come true, and what comes true will not come to pass, says a folk saying. And for good reason, because fortune telling on New Year's Eve was considered the most truthful among the people, and everything would come true. Now, if you would like to try some of the fortune telling or divination, here is how to do so. And mind you, this is mainly for unmarried women, but I'll also mention some that everyone can do. Now, to do this correctly, get in a serious mood, your hair should be loose, and uh, there should be no knots on your clothes, and you also have to remove all your jewelry, for example, bracelets and rings. And also, you have to formulate the questions to which you want to know the answer during the fortune telling really clearly. 
Hundreds of years ago, Ukrainians claimed that the only fortune telling and the power of which you sincerely believe will come true. So here are some different fortune telling techniques. The first one is fortune telling with cups. Uh, this fortune telling requires several cups, um, as many as there are people during the fortune telling. Then you have to put in separate cups, a ring, a coin, bread, sugar, onion, salt, and a little bit of water. With your eyes closed, each of the fortune tellers in turn chooses a cup. Prophecies for the future are as follows. If you get a ring, it means wedding. Coin means wealth. Bread means abundance. Sugar means fun. Onion means tears. Salt means misfortune or trials. And if you get a cup with water, it means your life will not undergo much change in the new year. The second divination is the Vareniki divination. Vareniki, if you remember, are really similar to pierogi, and they are very, very popular during Christmas, New Year's, and honestly, just all the time in Ukraine. So while preparing your Vareniki, especially with potatoes for the New Year's Eve table, you can put some surprises in them along with the usual filling. And these surprises are coins, rings, and nuts. Divination itself takes place directly while eating a meal, of course, really carefully. If someone gets a coin or some grains, it means that they will be wealthy in the new year. A thread means travels, salt means tears, sugar, a good or secure life, a ring means marriage, a nut, a presence of two grooms, a pepper means a new suitor, and if you get a cherry pit, it means an addition to the family. The third one is divination by desire. Before going to bed on New Year's Eve, write 12 wishes on separate pieces of paper and make sure you word them really carefully. Then fold them up, put them under your pillow. In the morning when you wake up, pull out three of them and they will definitely come true in the new year. The next one is divination on the character of the groom. If you expect an arranged marriage or you just want to know what kind of husband you will get, on the first night of the new year, before going to bed, put playing cards with the image of kings under your pillow. In the morning, without looking, you need to draw one card. Whatever king you get symbolizes the kind of man your husband will be. The king of spades is old and jealous. The king of clubs is a military man. The king of hearts is young and rich. And the king of diamonds is very desirable. The next one is divination by thread. Insert three threads into three needles. The threads have to be black, white, and red. Have someone carefully pin them down on your clothes from the back without you knowing the order in which the needles are located. Then you have to pull out one of the threads. If you pull out a red thread, that means that you will have a quick marriage or I suppose in our modern world, a serious relationship in the new year. A white thread means remaining single, and a black thread means that marriage will not bring you happiness and you need to pay attention to your career. Number six is divination on grains, and this is the last one. You have to place small bowls with different grains in a circle. Buckwheat, millet, rice, semolina, oatmeal, pearl barley, and pour water into another bowl. The girls will take turns spinning a raw egg in the center of the circle and see to which bowl the egg will roll. If to buckwheat, the groom will be rich. To millet, he will be blonde. To rice, he will be married. To smolina, the groom will be from the north. To pearl barley, the groom will be a military man. Water means that the girl will be traveling. And if the egg spins in place, it means that the girl will not be married this year. A separate large scale tradition of the Eve of Generosity is a party with traditional dressing up as animals and folklore characters, a mystical rite carnival. According to an ancient legend, Malanka was transformed into a goat to be saved from demons. The pagan Malanka, that is. The goat also symbolizes wealth, happiness, prosperity, health, and other wonderful things. The quote-unquote walking of the goat Malanga is one of the most fun rites. New Year's carolers would accompany the goat, 
which boys would often be changed into this goat and try to headbutt the owners when they came into their house to carol. According to the ritual, a goat was killed and then it had to be revived with songs and jokes. But the goat, as befits a domestic animal, never went alone on these holidays. It was led by a crowd of dressed up goat breeders who went from house to house singing shidrivki and playing small shows. The goat was held uh, by the character of Grandfather, and he had a huge nose and red cheeks and a hump which could be seen on his back. Grandfather's mask is a typical image of an old merchant who, despite his age, remained fond of girls and a glass of wine. Since the time of the Kyivan Rus, the main masquerade characters were totemic animals. Bear, cow, wolf, fox, cat, etc. The culmination of Malanka actually is usually the struggle of bears for the title of the strongest. Of course, people would be dressed in all of these animal costumes. Later, more and more Christian and satirical motives appeared in ritual actions. People started to stage improvised plays, mocking the shortcomings of society. Among other characters, old woman, pub owner and his wife, priest the drunkard, young man, monk, young woman, Cossack, devil, soldier, policeman were present. Of course, all these shows and characters required costumes. Traditionally, carnival masks were made from leather, paper, papier mache, flour, glue, and starch. The mask of the goat was usually made out of wood and covered with fur. The lower jaw was movable with a rope tied to it, and then the goat would move its mouth. Usually after the holidays, masks were thrown away because it was considered for some reason a sin to keep the mask. On the eve of the new year, a new character also appears in this folk drama, and that is, of course, Malanka. Malanka, the woman, not the goat. This is very confusing. There are too many Malankas, but this is how it is. So this particular Malanka role was always performed by a boy who disguised himself as a girl, Malanka. What's interesting is on New Year's Eve, women would dress up as male characters and men would dress up as female characters. So this Malanka would be richly dressed. Instead of a mask, she would have painted eyebrows and rosy cheeks. In her hands, she would hold a spindle or a broom or a doll or some kind of attribute of a woman. And Malanka would be a very horrible housewife. So according to the script, the boy would parody women's activities, doing everything really awkwardly and backwards and just poorly. Uh, to make it funny. Malanka also, of course, has the companion Vasil, who saved her in the um, pagan story. And next to them would be grandma and grandpa, which would be symbolizing the experience of generations. And of course, together with them, there would be other festive characters. They would mostly be divided into the good characters that would dance, sing, and usually not wear any masks. And of course, the bad, the impure, the evil. And they would joke around, make fun of others, and they will always wear masks. Traditionally, while walking around to all the houses, Malankas added wishes for family happiness to the usual wishes for health and prosperity, and of course they would sing shidrifkas with everybody else. The entire processions of dressed-up people, with the goat and Malanka being the most important, walked through the streets, entertaining passerbys and doing all kinds of pranks, as well as wishing everyone Happy New Year. The next day is January 1st, or Basil's Day, both the saint and the pagan god. On January 1st, it is believed that this evening, a generous god descends from the sky, inspects the entire household, and enters the house. In pre-Christian times, Ukrainians would bake an entire pig to sacrifice to Basil, who was considered the patron saint of this animal. Then he gave the family wealth and happiness. It is also possible to prepare various dishes from pork, like holodet, sausage, and salo, etc. But the most important ritual happens in the morning, and it is sowing, since, remember, New Year's used to happen in the spring, and it is highly associated with agriculture. It is also customary to saw, meaning to scatter grain on the floor in people's houses. So, early in the morning, on the New Year, men, not women, 
went to neighbors, relatives, and friends to sow grain in their houses. To do this, they scattered wheat, oat, barley, rye grains around the house and in the house, and they said, for luck, for health, for the new year. This custom had ritual significance, since it was believed that it brings prosperity, happiness, and wealth to the family. It is considered a very good omen if a man crosses the threshold of the house first in the new year. The timing of the sower's arrival is also important. The one who arrived first was usually given special attention. They say that the first sower brings happiness to the house. All the sowers were given a monetary reward, part of which is given to the church. It is important not to throw away the sown grain. It should be collected and stored. In the village, for example, grain is stored until spring um, or until it is time to sow and mixed with other grains for the real sowing of grain and seeds in the ground. This rite is popular throughout the territory of Ukraine. It is widespread both in the west and in the east. It is also interesting that there is a tradition of sowing among other Eastern Slavic countries, for example, in Poland, Belarus, and Slovakia. But when Ukraine was part of and one might even say occupied by the Soviet Union, New Year's was completely different. The Soviet New Year celebration was a substitute of Christmas since religion was banned. People would have a large feast, invite friends and family, and stay up long past midnight. The Christmas tree was called the New Year's tree, and a man who looks kind of like Santa Claus uh, was called Dead Moroz, meaning Grandfather Frost, and he was the one who brought children presents under the tree, which they opened at midnight on New Year's. Now, Grandfather Frost was also a Soviet invention based on folklore and fairy tales that had really nothing to do with the holiday. The man who came up with the character was Pavel Postashev, a man whose face was frequently used as the face of Grandfather Frost on children's drawings in the 1930s and 40s. Postashev was also one of the key people in enacting the 1932-33 Holodomor, which was a genocide of Ukrainians and which killed millions of them. That's some food for thought. This holiday of the New Year, the Eve of Generosity, is one of those that form the identity of the nation, along with Christmas and Easter. Singing Shchedrivki, having masquerade performances and a special feast, as well as performing magic and communicating with spirits, is all that makes Ukrainian New Year a rather unique and complex mixture of pagan, Christian, and simply Ukrainian.
Thank you so much for joining me today, and this was what we need to know about Ukraine this week. 